Hey everyone, I'm Alex. And I'm Jack. And today we're here to kick off our massive series ranking every boss in the Soulsborne Collective, starting with the bottom 10 and working our way up from there. As you can all probably tell by our inability to go one video without comparing something to one of these games, we are very much so fans of the franchise. So it is that we've decided to revisit the series with a definitive, all-encompassing look at the bosses, be they good or vile, or something in between. As far as rules go, it's pretty much what you'd expect. No fodder mini-bosses from Elden Ring or Sekiro, no summoning, spirit ashes or cheeses done in our playthroughs, yada yada. As always, we offer a sincere thank you to our patrons, some of which were able to watch this a week before everyone else thanks to their support. With that all said, it's time to dig in and see who comes out where per our combined rankings. Number 193, Sir Gideon Ofnir, The All-Knowing When Alex and I first began this project, our prospective idea for the worst boss were the generic ones. You know, like the Bed of Chaos, the Bed of Chaos, or the Bed of Chaos, maybe the Thumerian Descendant if we wanted to stir up the comments. If this was the Kentucky Derby, they were like the 12 to 5 low payout horses, and Gideon Ofnir. So Kingsley, they uh, do this all the time? So bad, actually. <clears throat> Sir, Gideon Ofnir was that one 5,000 to 1 horse with a weird colored saddle and an especially tiny jock that blew out the competition. He not only lapped everyone in the race, but left a giant pile of shit and flung it on all the other contestants, leaving us with no choice but to hand Gideon Ofnir the title of WGD. POS MFC of all time. Keep in mind, the last time Alex and I played Elden Ring was months before the now infamous patches. I forgot they happened in all honesty, but after the fact, some of my takeaways from this post-patch playthrough are, for example, Radon is way easier, Melania is still just as fucking hard, and Gideon Offnir must have got injected with Green Goblin juice and Captain America juice. It was like an alien when everyone left that dude that died from the larva, and then like 20 minutes later the thing had turned into the Xenomorph. I mean, Jesus. Jesus Christ, look at the difference between our first video and now. Not that it matters much here necessarily, but to just get it out of the way, my run quality in Elden Ring was absolutely terrible. And Alex's was really good, which led to a massive discrepancy in opinions for a good number of the bosses. My character, Michelangelo, was a little twink dex build that used to work well, but is a relic of the past. Alex's, Broly Ape, was a monstrous strength build using the Blasphemous Blade that scorched the lands between with no mercy. But even with our vastly different experiences, somehow we both happened to come to the same conclusion on Gideon Ofnir. He very well may be the worst boss in any video game. Ever. On that note, and not to sidetrack again, but also to sidetrack again, considering this is a compiled list of 193 individual fights, there are, as expected, some huge gaps in our rankings. While this isn't, for others where let's say I ranked at 180 and Alex had at 30, while we tried placing them in the median spot, it would still be unfair for only one of us to comment on that fight. As a warning, some bosses we couldn't evenly rank, but the long story short is don't shit your pants when you hear the both of us speak our piece on the same boss. Nonetheless, what makes the all-knowing old fart of Elden Ring the worst of the worst? I guess it can be explained sorta of like, well, take everything you hate about any boss you'd consider terrible, and triple whatever makes that boss so bad. Like, I fucking hate the Underground Gunner, so they took his shitty arena and put it in a Souls game. Remember that dickwad Crimson Head from Resident Evil? Why not add some overaggression, and in homage to the source material, tack on some fucking horribly bad damage balancing? Remember how unreasonably long the infested chopper was in Devil May Cry 2? I could have cooked a turkey with the time I spent fighting that thing. So yeah, let's make it last double time, because whoever tested this thought it was a good idea that he can recover his entire health bar at will. Oh, and you want to stop him? Don't worry, he'll just fucking explode! Anyways, as much as I try my best to not get angry anymore, Gideon Offnir was like a fucking rhino pill for my rage. And there definitely was a level of embarrassment to it all because of how easy he was on my first playthrough. I had the genius idea of playing Elden Ring right after easing my way back into Soulsborne from a three year absence with Demon Souls, and Gideon Offnir, of all bosses going from fraudulent fodder to full power Frieza, was not on my bingo card. Going from Demon Souls to Elden Ring was like getting off a horse buggy and into a rocket ship. To keep it light, I sucked at Elden Ring. And I sucked the most at fighting Gideon Ofnir. But I'd argue that's on him, not me. Gideon Ofnir is like that one dude that no matter what he does, it just kinda pisses you off. 
What is that weird red eye thing that spawns on you when you start a new fight with him? Why does he have Wrath of the Gods that one-shots you? Why did every single one of his spells dish out my entire health bar like I'm made of fucking mango butter? Oh yeah, lest I forget that fucking bullshit Estus flask. After around my 30th attempt, I decided to go full scumbag mode and sat back using Beast Roar from a quote unquote safe distance. I didn't give a shit anymore, but frankly, he's a fucking cunt, so I shouldn't have to care. If there's a cheese, do it. If there's a skip, do it. Fuck Gideon Offnir, and I pray to god that whenever the supposedly real Elden Ring DLC comes out, you don't need to beat him to get there. Number 192, Ludden Zalin, The King's Pets. I would personally describe myself as an animal lover. For the most part, animals possess a sort of purity and innocence that precludes them from moral judgment. But then of course you have the evil ones like dolphins, ducks, and these two big cats from hell. I can't overtly tell you guys what their favorite hobby is without costing us monetization, but it rhymes with grape. I'm sure you can figure it out if you put on your thinking caps. It's outright unfathomable that this encounter was designed in good faith by people attempting to create an enjoyable experience for players willing to purchase the DLC on release, or for that matter that it was even made as an optional super boss meant to test the cutting edge of player skill. Lud and Zalin are neither. They're a trollish trap door at the end of a twisted funhouse engineered for maximum cruelty. The only thing that could have made this more ridiculous would be if the snowstorm persisted into the boss arena. Extra details like their accelerated weapon durability degradation are just further proof of the joke FromSoft was trying to play on us all by airdropping these two reskinned shitlunks into the home stretch of the worst area in video game history. Ava is already a janky mess on her lonesome, so it's about as fun as you'd expect dealing with two more beasts from the same litter concurrently. As if that wasn't enough, they start healing themselves once they sense death on the horizon. It's not enough to majorly increase the difficulty, but on principle, I am disgusted and appalled. The notion that I should have to replay the frigid outskirts or even face the possibility of such a thing is ludicrous, and both of these creatures should be broiled to death in an enormous cauldron of molten lava. I have never met anyone on Earth who thinks these two deserve any better, and the day I do meet such individuals will be very sad. This fight deserves to languish in the infernal bowels of not just our list, but everyone else's lists as well. Number 191 bed of chaos. Before we began this whole thing, I felt daring. I felt ready to shock the world with my refreshing takes after replaying the Soul series with a newfound maturity, knowledge, skill, and power. And then I fought the bed of chaos and within 30 seconds just went like, yep, this fight fucking sucks. Truthfully, I never thought the bed of chaos was the worst boss in Dark Souls up until this playthrough. The capper demon is a tracksuit mobster with two pit bulls in an alley, the centipede demon is whatever the hell he is, and the Moonlight Butterfly is a floating green melatonin that'll make your brain implode without needing an overdose. I mean, I rarely ever died to the bed of chaos, so I just didn't get the hate. There was once a time when I was so confident and so relaxed about fighting this boss that I tried punching it to death and managed to get it to half health. Oh, it's important to note that these rankings are based only on our experiences when we fought them on these specific files. Some weird one-off shit happened? Well, it happened, so that boss is going to deal with the consequences. It was important to us to make this list as authentic as possible. And on that note, my authentic opinion on the bed of chaos is that he's a giant turd log. After never having it happen before, I'll admit getting constantly swept to your death by shit boxes and oversized walls 9 to 10 times isn't actually that fun, and that's mostly due to the minute long run back to refight him. On the point of run ups, there's a sort of weird dilemma about Souls bosses in that we weren't exactly sure whether or not to count them against the bosses. To some, run ups are half the fight, which is a valid opinion. You die, and by technicality, the fight restarts when you respawn at the bonfire and begin sprinting back. The counter would be that the boss is only the fight, which is also factually true. Then there's the extreme argument that the entire area preceding a boss is part of it. But sometimes an entire area is a run-up, like Lud and Zalin, or all of Demon Souls. So what the fuck? We ended up deciding on discretion, and while obviously in an ideal world all the games would have like Stakes of America, I also think the run-ups are a bit overblown. None of them are that long or difficult, and to me they're sort of nostalgically charming because of how primal they feel. Anyways, all of that was to say that the Bed of Chaos is a pain in the ass because you have to sprint through the Lost Isolith to get back to him. The Lost Isolith is to visual appeal what a taco fart is to the sense of smell. The main problem I had wasn't the run-up itself actually, mainly how many times I had to do it. 
Because that's the other thing, after Elden Ring I felt like every other game was in slow motion. It made Dark Souls feel like I was watching 12 angry men at quarter speed. As I've said a dozen times already, the bed of chaos repeatedly killed me, and every time it felt like there was very little I could do. In retrospect, the best piece of advice I can give is to just tank the hits. In a backwards sort of way, over aggressive defense by constantly rolling is a grave mistake in this fight, and as you can see, basically all of my deaths come from that. It is simply impossible to avoid his sweeps at times unless you're on the outskirts of the arena and can only be hit by the little branches. The fight is admittedly an alright concept, it's sort of Nintendo gimmicky but it just doesn't work because the bed of chaos doesn't give you the time or space to actually reach his nards. However, I think everyone says it, but doesn't actually realize how thoughtful FromSoft were giving us a checkpoint for each artery. Even they knew how badly they fucked up. I don't know if people realize how unbelievably fucking nasty this fight would be if you had to go from one side to the other and back again in one go. Frankly, it alone probably would have killed the entire franchise, leaving it for dead as a forgotten 2010's Xbox 360 cult classic. And by the way, the fact that the only praise I can hand out to this is that you get to spend less time with it as you progress is not a very high compliment. On that note, why the fuck did they decide to break the ground in the spots they did? It feels like they meticulously tested which spots are the most common to get hit at and followed that up by adding insta-death holes right behind them. It gets even worse after you destroy the first ball and have to deal with the bed's new attacks and pyromancies. After the first ball gets destroyed, you'd think it got sprayed with like a pesticide or some shit. The thing is just way too aggressive and can hit you from any angle. It's like trying to fight Floyd Mayweather. I just find it easiest to kill myself after each ball because it's almost like edging myself trying to make you to the other side. You'll get to the middle and then get hit by something off screen or from the ground you couldn't even tell was there. Order is also very important here, and I like to go for the left nut first because of the big cock branch that provides a safety barrier. Then I go for the right, which once again is easier when you reset down the middle. And once you knock them both out, it's pretty chill making it to the finish line. Alex has always had a big problem with rolling into the center branch, but I honestly never have. Anyways, the finale is the worst, because in the center of it all is a fucking bug. What a load of horseshit. All that work just to curb stomp a termite. I do think the concept of a stationary boss with weak points that grows in power as each one gets destroyed could work really well, but this went about as wrong as it possibly could have. Number 190, Armor Spider. Look, I know some of you like this guy. I hang out on Magic Cat's server every so often because all of us ranking YouTubers are part of a secret cabal. A lot of people on there, the big man himself included, seem to find this encounter to be at the very least palatable. Well, as you can see here, we do not. But I of course invite all Armor Spider fans out there to educate us on what makes this boss anything more than a gruelingly boring waste of time. And please, Please don't say, but it's unique! I refuse to accept this reason. It would be unique if a boss jumped out of your TV screen and took a shit on your rug. Doesn't mean it's good. As for why the armor spider sucks, I'll say off the bat that it's not even cool. There are a handful of bosses with mediocre gameplay who can claw up a few spots thanks to being an awesome character, having a neat design, or just being the focus of a grand spectacle. The armor spider is none of these. He is a generic spider scaled up to 50 times size who is unable to move with a moveset centrally designed around crippling your ability to move. Are you dreaming of running up to his face to do some damage? Too bad, because he'll regularly have you running fog door relay races where you can do nothing but gaze wistfully at the sea of flame. Make sure not to get hit by his ranged attacks on your way back, which render you unable to run or roll. Are you starting to see a pattern here? You have almost no agency in this fight, and it is on purpose! This is a video game, a medium defined by player agency. I want to do things and see things happen. The most exciting this fight gets is when favorable luck lets you settle into a comfortable cycle of getting one hit in, running backwards, and repeating until he decides to leak flaming oil out of his little dick hole for half a minute. Demon Souls has by far the weakest boss roster of the games, but this is the most offensively tedious one of the lot. Number 189, Capra Demon. I think Capra Demon may well be the worst idea for a boss in all of Soulsborne, and for the record, I beat him first try on three separate files, so I'm not letting a lack of failure discredit the abysmal design choices taken with this fight. As a standalone enemy, he's fine. He's a product of Dark Souls' limited development schedule, as evidenced by the... 
overpopulation problem in the demon ruins. As with most other minor bosses, who are also enemies in the game, his attack pool is limited to 3 or 4 moves in total, he's slow, he telegraphs, and he's easy to kill for a nice cash bonus. I have zero opinions on him as an enemy, positive or negative. But when it's him, plus two of those laboratory made ass fuck dogs in an alley designed for little people, there's a major fucking problem. And that's without even mentioning the lower undead Berg, one of the most lazily designed, horrible run-ups in the entire series. And I know, I just said run-ups aren't that bad, but this is awful. No way around it. The abandoned streets of Fuckville are crowded with little ninja shits that can parry any weapon short of a nuclear bomb and give you bleed in the process. Oh, and there's five dogs along the way. It's a linear path, but the sheer volume of enemies make it almost impossible to run straight through. When I timed it, it took me a minute and 20 seconds to get to the Capra Demon on my first win. Without killing any enemies. That's insane! I always say you should save this boss for after the Bell Gargoyles, because if I hadn't had good vitality or a decently upgraded weapon, I'm probably looking at a 5 minute pit stop between each attempt at the Capra Demon, who would also be triple as hard under leveled. And that's entirely due to his arena. In a way, I can understand the idea, and at least they took a chance with it. But YB and Namir took a chance with Soul Train, and look where that took him. My general strat is to immediately roll past Capra and knock out the first dog. He's slow enough to where if he does the jump attack, he probably won't get you before you get the dog. Some people recommend using the stairs as distance control, but with the difference in elevation, it's almost impossible to hit the dogs there. And it's so tight anyways, you'll probably just fall off and get cornered. The hardest step of this fight is killing Dog 2, there's no strategy and it's total chaos getting it, but once you do, Capra alone is easy enough. Also, I'd actually recommend using the stairs when it's only the Capra Demon left. When you drop down, he'll follow and get staggered when he lands, open to at least two hits. He's easy to dodge, so beyond the dogs, there isn't too much trouble. All the pain and fuckery is everything before. Plus, I got a cool YOLO kill. Anyways, as much as I remember the Capra Demon, I also remember the time I snapped my ankle in three parts. Satisfying as he may be, this upper body only cow skull can suck it. Number 188, Royal Rat Authority. Four seconds. That's how long you have to kill three tiny enemies with hitboxes untouchable by most attacks until the big guy stops snoozing on the rock and leaps down. I see people regularly float numbers like 10 seconds, but that's just flagrantly wrong and I implore them to actually play the game. Within this minuscule window of the fight beginning, everything is decided in an instant. More often than not, you'll get toxic the moment you walk inside and stroll right into instant death. It's hard to explain how this is possible, but the fight doesn't even feel like my performance or skill has anything to do with it. I don't feel like my successful attempt was any more deserving of victory than my handful of failures. It felt like I was just tossing a loaded dice in the air and praying I didn't get a bad roll. Once the miniature rats are dead, the fight is good as over. The Authority himself has shit boxes galore, as most Dark Souls 2 bosses tend to, but he doesn't hit hard enough or fast enough for it to be a real issue. As with all the other bosses I've discussed thus far, there are a couple observable common denominators. Among the big offenders, I'd circle out lack of creativity, near non-existent lore, forgettable music, and of course, how frustrating a fight is. The Royal Red Authority isn't just all of these, however. It's also completely pointless. You gain nothing? Zilch? Your squandered time is rewarded with enough souls to finance a trip to Dollar General or a gumball machine. This game needs this fight like I need a root canal and a kick to the nuts. Number 187, The One Reborn. Maybe I thought the Bed of Chaos wasn't going to be as bad as I remembered, but I knew without a shadow of a doubt that The One Reborn was going to stink the place out. Is Bloodborne as good a game as I used to think it was? Even better. Are its bosses? No. Not even close. The One Reborn is like... When you're taking a fever shit, so when you're wearing clothes it's too hot and you take them off and then you freeze your balls off and put them back on. He's like the embodiment of discomfort, and fighting him is like sucking the juice out of a rotten orange. And it all starts with this run up. It's not exactly long, or hard to get through. It's this weird in-between where you have to pay attention to auditory cues for 30 seconds while running in diagonals. Like, you're just left questioning yourself the whole time. I don't even know how to describe him physically either. I guess he's some giant amalgamation of arms, legs, tits, and testes with a figurative and probably literal asshole on top running the show. Maybe not visually, but in terms of overall layout, this fight definitely pays homage to the pretty good but overrated Tower Knight from Demon's Souls. The 
The arena features six chime maidens around the edges of an upper layer who can buff and heal him. Like the Tower Knight, you walk around and kill them, but unlike the Tower Knight, the One Reborn can just pop out of nowhere and launch a piss missile at you for a third of your HP. And once you get rid of the chime maidens, it's a long, shitty patience game. Weirdly, the One Reborn was designed around not being attacked. Anytime you approach him, he flares all his limbs around, leaving you stunlocked and open to the infamous body rain. If you can sneak in a combo though, he'll drop to the ground and take increased damage from the head. You still have to pay attention to the body rain, which is a constant nuisance throughout the whole fight. However, like the last giant or amygdala, he has a very broad moveset that you'll hardly ever see because almost your entire time will be spent under him in the same spot. Admittedly, I sort of fucked myself by not using papers or beast blood pellets, but on my new game plus file, I think the gameplay can explain why I didn't. I rarely ever die in this game, so I felt like using those would neutralize the bosses too much. All in all, the process of hitting his body pad or whatever it is over and over is tedious, dumb, frustrating as shit, and pointless. This is an example of a boss with literally zero well-made design choices. Fucking awful. Number 186, Thumerian Descendant. This guy is a spaz, and not in the cool way. He looks like he hangs out in grocery store parking lots, nodding off fentanyl and banging on your car window, begging for 20s. Fortunately, real life knowledge transfers pretty cleanly here, and the solution to both characters is the same. Shoot them when they run towards you, then tear out their organs with your offhand. That said, it takes a lot more bullets and visceral attacks to kill the Thumerian Descendant than it does his hobo kinfolk. This fight is different from some of the ones before in that it's very fast-paced and nobody could ever accuse it of being boring, but it ends up falling into the other, perhaps even more loathsome category, detestably frustrating. I've observed one major difference in the way I evaluate bosses compared to a lot of people, which I'll explain early on into the series. I would rather a boss be neutral than outright unpleasant. Some people automatically place, for instance, True King Alant at the bottom because he does absolutely fuck nothing. As for me, I don't care, he's not pissing me off, he's just a lame pushover. I would take a hundred worthless fodder bosses before I willingly fought a single frustrating piece of shit boss. If you disagree, I can understand it. Maybe you prefer the emotionally charged experience of a boss infuriating you over the hollow ennui that ensues when you effortlessly strike down Pinwheel for the 900th time. We just have to agree to disagree on that. To put it succinctly, I would rather watch paint dry than have my testicles forced through a meat grinder, which is how it feels to fight the Thumerian Descendant. His shotos being able to fly through walls as if they're holograms is ridiculous and rubs me the wrong way. All in all, not a fan. Number 185, Laron Dark Beast. Yeah, yeah, we all know the chalices aren't that fun. I'm not a full-on hater, like the grind sucks, but it can be entertaining at times. Plus, I created a monster in my character, Runa Derligig, aka Jewels from Pulp Fiction, all thanks to my blood gem Escapade. I thought my original character, Lil Durtop or Mensis Joker, was OP, and then came this run with my plus 10 saw cleaver, 60 skill, and plus 450 blood gem buff. With Beast Blood Pellets and anti Laron Dark Beast Paper, I beat a boss that takes the average fella at least 5 minutes in 2 and a half. With shitty AI. Oh wait, that's just the normal AI. Honestly, my god run makes a point of how awful this thing is. I didn't even have to put up with it for half as long as usual, and hated it just as much. Do I suck at this boss? You betcha. But I also find it hard to believe that anyone is particularly excellent at fighting this thing. It's erratic, impossible to track, has a mix of bad telegraphs and timings, and even worse hitboxes. I'd like to save overall points in the boss's design for the Dark Beast Parl segment coming later down the road, but that's already a boss neither Alex nor I are really fans of. The Laron Dark Beast is like taking a meal you really hate and then adding a bunch of shitty condiments and water on top. Fuck this abysmal boss. I'm so happy I never even have to think about this piece of shit ever again. Number 184, Gravelord Nito. This is a pick that breaks my heart. Nito looks totally awesome, so it's a shame that he's a half-assed fraud. For starters, he fights like a pussy. Take one step into his arena and a whole squadron of skeletons jumps you in a 5v1, which will be impossible to dispatch unless you brought a blessed weapon with you. That requires prolonged exposure to the AIDS-inducing upgrade system of Dark Souls 1, however, so I opted to suffer through the hordes as the lesser of two evils. 
Before Nito even strolls into view, he's going to be trying to sneak his giant toxic dildos up your bunghole by shooting them up through the floor. This is signified by a piercing shriek, which comes roughly one Mississippi count before you need to roll out of the way of the incoming prostate check. It's unique in that it's one of the only moves in the series to use auditory rather than visual cues. Well, you already know how I feel about innovation and deviation from design norms. Fail. <laughs> The best way to beat him without the aid of blessed weapons is to kiss his ass and bait his AoE, which hilariously enough kills his own goons for you in one fell swoop. It's easy to mock, but honestly this is a major plus and one big reason I didn't have him much lower than this myself. That little shining bright spot aside, the Nito experience is generally some combination of getting your personal space invaded by cartwheeling dead people and ragdolling around like a chump until you wear him down to bone dust. The fact that they managed to make one of the hardest designs in Lordran a sluggish bum still blows my mind, and it's a wonder he isn't even the worst Lord Soul boss. If Nito's goal is to have people join his army of the dead, he's taking a powerful first step by by making sure everyone who fights him wants to blow their head off. I'd like to add that the skeletons were way worse than I used to think. Their aggression is insane. I should have died like five times in my winning fight. The fact that they give a bleed effect makes it double as bad because they already fuck your ass with how many there are and how little reprieve you get, even with the AoE. I also made a major mistake not using the right of kindling and beefing up the bonfire before this to at least plus 10 Estus. Running out of Estus in this fight and relying on humanity is a death sentence. Just use that humanity and get it to plus 20 and you'll never die again. I just think overall Nito has a little too much range and aggression for my taste, and while I don't think it's a god-awful boss, it doesn't have a lot going for it either. Like Alex said, this is like a Gucci looking bag made out of material from Shane. Thank you so much for watching and we hope you enjoyed. Remember to like and subscribe, and be sure to stay tuned for part 2 of this ranking coming soon. That's all for now, deuces.